So my love for science uh, started from a very young age. So this is Christmas, I think about 1988 in the Miller household. Um, you can tell it's the 80s, probably from the decor of the house, um, what my dad's wearing, but more importantly, my sister's haircut. <laughs> um, so I'm eight years old here, and this is the present that I got that year. It was a microscope. And science still fascinates me today. And often when we talk about science, we sort of quite often associate it with grandness and the awesomeness of things like space and planets. But for me, there's awesomeness and greatness in each and every one of us sitting here today in this theatre. So you all recognise this. This is DNA, life's instruction manuals. And it's the same in all living organisms, from snakes to the stegosaurus, from people to pandas. And although the DNA code is different in these organisms, the actual structure of the DNA is the same. So if we peel apart the double helix, what we find are two strands. Both have a sugar phosphate backbone, which is this purple, and attached to this are a series of organic bases, and these are named A, T, C, and G. And these organic bases follow a simple rule. A will always match with T, and C will always match with G. So when the DNA separate, separates so it can replicate, a complementary strand of DNA could be created. And it's the series of these A's, C's, T's and G's that make our genetic code, that make us. And in the human genome, we have three billion of these A's, T's, C's and G's. So that means if you were to read one of these bases per second for 24 hours a day, it would take you over a century to read our genetic code. So what does the genetic code mean? Well, all along our DNA are regions of genetic code that provide the instructions for the trait of the organism. And these regions are called genes. And genes can provide instructions for a single trait. They can provide instructions for multiple traits. So we have genes as humans that control our body plan to design our legs and our arms, etc. We also have genes that determine our eye colour. But more importantly, our genes code for things called proteins. And the proteins are the workhorses inside our cells. They carry out all the necessary jobs in our cells for our cells to behave properly, and in turn, our bodies to behave properly. So for instance, haemoglobin is a protein that carries the oxygen around our bodies. And in humans, we have about between 20 to 25,000 genes within our DNA. And our DNA, all two meters of it, is then tightly packed up into things called chromosomes, of which we have 23 pairs. And then our chromosomes are tightly packed into the nucleus, which is found at the center of our cells. So DNA is important. It codes for everything to make us. But as important as DNA is, it's also really vulnerable, and it can be damaged. And this damage can come from normal byproducts of cellular processes that are going on every day inside our cells. So when the DNA is replicated, the DNA has to be pulled apart, it's stretched, it's pushed, it's compacted again, and this can cause stresses to the DNA. But DNA damage can also come from external factors. This can include cigarette smoke, UV light, and radiation. So what are the consequences of excessive DNA damage to humans? Well, they could be pretty severe. So here I've got two examples of patients that have problems with excessive uh, DNA damage. If you look here on the left, this patient here, so if we're looking at the MRI in A and C and comparing it to B and D, the patient in A and C has a condition called microcephaly, which means small head. And this is caused by excessive DNA damage in the neurological tissue. The patient on the right here, the young girl wearing glasses, has a condition called Seckel syndrome. And the excessive DNA damage here has caused growth problems. And this young girl is actually the same age as a girl whose lap she's sitting in. But DNA damage can also be the start of diseases, such as cancer. So you can imagine if DNA damage happens in a gene that's important for the cell to prevent cancer, 
you can start to understand where the problems can occur. So how common is DNA damage? How often does it happen? Well, our cells have the potential to experience up to one million DNA breaks per day. But that begs the question, why aren't more of us suffering from the effects of DNA damage? And it's because our cells are clever, really clever. And they've evolved a system to be able to monitor any DNA damage that occurs. So we have a surveillance system. And our cells have a life cycle. And at the end of the life cycle, the cell will divide into two daughter cells. And this surveillance system monitors the cell as it goes through its cycles, looking for any DNA damage. If the cell detects DNA damage, it will stop the cell from cycling. And then it's presented with two options. If the DNA damage is too great, then the cell will instigate programmed cell death. So the cell will kill itself, and this is called apoptosis. However, if it can, the cell will try and repair the DNA. So this is our DNA DIY repair toolkit. But instead of tools, we have these proteins. So as I said before, proteins are things in our cells that carry out jobs. So within our DNA repair kit, we have specific proteins to repair specific types of DNA damage. Like any toolkit, there are tools for specific jobs. So we have tools in our DNA repair kit that can repair single base damage. So a damaged A, a damaged T, or a damaged C. We have tools that will come in, remove that damaged base, and put in a fixed one. We also have tools in our DNA repair kit that can repair single-stranded breaks within the DNA. And again, tools will come in, they'll tidy at the ends of the DNA breaks, stick them back together. And lastly, we also have tools to deal with DNA double-strand breaks. And these are particularly important, they have to be dealt with. Because if a single DNA double strand break is left unrepaired, it's enough to kill the cell. And this is what I research on. So why do we need to understand these processes that are going on within our cells? Well, it's important, especially for things like DNA damage, because these can be the start of diseases, as I mentioned earlier, like cancer. So it's important to understand how these diseases may begin within the cell. And it's also important to understand these kind of processes for when we're trying to develop treatments for these kind of diseases. Because once we know how each individual tool comes into play, then maybe we can target those and develop novel chemotherapeutic treatments. So I'd like to introduce you to a gene. And this gene is called BRCA1. And BRCA1 stands for Breast Cancer Associated 1. Now we all have this gene inside of us which is a point I really want to get across, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in a minute why. In the early 90s, it was discovered that mutations in this gene were linked to hereditary breast cancers. So this meant that we all have this gene, but if it's mutated, it can increase your risk to breast cancer. And this was in the limelight quite recently, only last year, when Angelina Jolie discovered that she had mutations in BRCA1. And for this reason, she went through with a double preventative mastectomy. And this actually reduced her risk of breast cancer from 87% to 5%. And why I sort of stress it's really important to understand that we all have BRCA1. Quite often in the media, they talk about the BRCA1 gene. We all have the BRCA1 gene. It's when this gene is mutated that problems can arise. But following on the discovery, the mutations in BRCA1 can lead to hereditary breast cancer it was also discovered that the protein that's made by this gene, so the protein that's coded for by this gene, is a DNA repair tool. And to confuse matters even more, this DNA repair tool we're going to call BRCA1. <laughs> I hope you're still with me. Yeah. <clears throat> so BRCA1 is a DNA repair tool that's involved in the repair of DNA double-strand breaks, this particular toxic type of DNA break. So here we have a direct link between problems or mutations in a gene, that's required for DNA repair and cancer. So how can we use this information? Well, let's imagine a scenario. Here we have DNA in a healthy cell, and we've created a DNA double-strand break. 
Now again, our cells are wonderfully clever because they can repair this DNA double strand break in two ways. We have mechanism A on the left, mechanism on the right, sorry, mechanism B on the left. Now mechanism A requires BRCA1. So let's change the scenario and imagine we create this DNA break in a cancer cell, and particularly a cancer cell that has a problem or a mutation in BRCA1. Now this cancer cell can't repair this DNA double strand break this way because its BRCA1 is faulty, so it relies on mechanism 2. Now what if we could design a drug, a medicine, that can block mechanism B? Now in this cancer cell, if we create DNA damage, this cancer cell has no way of repairing the DNA damage. And the idea is, that the cell will create in, in within the DNA enough damage that the cell can't cope and the cell will die. The cancer cell will die. Well, this is a reality, and there are numerous clinical trials occurring across the world at the moment that are using this mechanism. But traditional chemotherapies, quite often when treating cancers, look at the common characteristics of cancers, the easy to reach fruit, if you will. But we're now heading to a new era of cancer treatments. We're looking to those harder to reach fruits. We're picking apart the genetic and the molecular changes that occur in cancer cells that make them different from normal cells. And if we can pinpoint and design treatments to specific, specifically target those changes, we can reduce the harmful side effects. So today, I've told you from the information that we've learned as scientists, about our own cells and DNA DIY repair kit. And what we can understand about DNA repair mechanisms, we've found a particular way of treating a certain type of cancer with a certain type of genetic change. Now for a disease that affects one in three of us, it still really surprises me how little is understood about cancer, how it starts, how it's treated, and today, I suppose, what I really would love to urge for all of you here today is to go out and become scientists yourself. Read, learn, research, find out about cancer. Because I truly believe the good communication between the public, doctors, the clinicians, and the research scientists is the only way of tackling this horrific disease. Thank you.